Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Tommy Vitor. John Lovett just didn't show up today. <laughs> That's so mean. He's not feeling well. He's not feeling well. He's under the weather. Yeah. He's okay, but he's just, uh, he wasn't ready for a pod today. Yep. He's he's uh, he's a little hoarse. A little hoarse. Maybe probably couldn't understand him. On today's show, Joe Biden says goodbye to his chief of staff and hello to more FBI agents. Donald Trump plots his Twitter comeback and struggles to get endorsements. Ruben Gallego will run for Kirsten Cinema's seat. And later, Elijah tests our skills with a new game called Take, Take, Don't Tell Me. Also, we recorded an interview with Democratic House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries here in the studio on Friday that will be running today as well. Still smells like power in here. It, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. Let's get to the news. Uh, President Biden celebrated the two-year anniversary of his inauguration by welcoming federal agents from the Justice Department to his home in Delaware, uh, where they recovered. Think you make them take their shoes off? What is <laughs> he wasn't the there. He was in Rehoboth. Right. So he, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Mask he said, up. He said, "You shoes guys, off. walk in. Whatever you need. Bring your own snacks. You can use the bathrooms." He was very gracious. Yeah. Um, anyway, they recovered six additional sets of records that contained an unspecified number of classified documents. Uh, so that's fun. New polling shows that about two thirds of Americans are both aware of mm -hmm. and troubled by Biden's actions. But most voters don't believe he should face charges. Thankfully, voters don't bring charges, but it's good to know they, <laughs> they don't think he should face them. The system would be bad. And more people do believe that Trump's case is more serious, which is good because it is. Right. Um, nevertheless, Democrats in Congress continue to ding Biden on the issue. Senator Dick Durbin uh, said on Sunday it diminishes Biden's stature, uh, while Joe Manchin said that the president should have a lot of regrets. Uh, Republicans are, of course, having a field day. <laughs> Here's the mansion's less annoying there. Yeah, I know. Like, wait, Dick stature? What are you stature? talking about? What is Senator that? Durbin? Uh, anyway, Republicans, unsurprisingly, are having a field day. Uh, here's a sampling from uh, Sunday show interviews with representatives Mike Turner, Nancy Mace, and James Comer. You know, clearly he's, he's become a serial classified document hoarder. Why did he have these? Who did he show them to? I mean, the only reason you can think of as to why anyone would take classified documents out of a classified space at home mm -hmm. is to is to show them to somebody. No, there's very little information about Biden. I mean, these documents were, were hidden for five years. We have very little information, whereas with the former president, everybody knows that those documents existed. They knew where they were. They knew where they were located. Well, they, uh, there was information that was presented I, I, to the let me stop you there. We didn't know where they were located. For example, it did take us. They defied a subpoena. It well, took the FBI, a search warrant. The DOJ, In fairness, they didn't know. Yeah. We need to know now who had access to those documents because our national security could be at risk. Well, I, this is, is this treason? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I just want to applaud our, our editing team there for those cuts. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's hilarious. She, I mean, oh, yeah. to, to argue, that was Nancy Mace, by the way. She is not like no. super MAGA. No. And to argue that, she was trying to argue that Donald Trump's is actually better than Joe Biden's situation because we all knew he was hiding the classified documents in his beach house. And we knew that because he refused to give them back, which is why FBI agents raided his house. Today, we learned that a former Philadelphia mob boss was at Donald Trump's like beach club and he took a picture with the president. So I think it's safe to say that those documents were less secure than and, uh, the stuff at the Biden's house. And by the way, I am glad that the team uh, ended the cut at Maria Bartiromo asking, is this treason? <laughs> What happened after that was even even James Comer, who is uh, the the head of the oversight committee, uh, Republican head of the oversight mm -hmm. committee, was speechless after <laughs> after Barrow's question. Like he couldn't even bring himself to say yes, it's treason. Yeah, it was, she, she is nuts. A few Chardonnays away from being uh, <laughs> Judge Pirro, unfortunately. <laughs> so Tommy uh, Biden said last week to reporters about this: "There's no there there." Uh, I know you guys covered this last week on Pod Save the World, but as someone who has dealt with uh, a lot of classified information, never at my house. I know that it's scattered in along, across right. your multiple residences. You were over there. Um, what do you think of this most recent discovery, <laughs> and how serious is this situation? We'll get to the politics in a second, just from a national security standpoint. I think you mean the 13-hour unconstitutional raid by jackbooted feds. <laughs> Merrick Garland's thugs. FBI Stoppo. That didn't quite work. Um, Which I'm sure, by the way, have you heard that they probably planted documents at Biden's I, house? They, I, they gave them time to plant five more pages over the weekend. 
Um, those takes were for my Tucker Carlson reel. So what we know, right, is that the, the White House said that DOJ found some classified records from Biden's time as vice president and from his time in the U.S. Senate. So if we're talking about this from a national security perspective, I mean, like a big chunk of classified material is supposed to be automatically declassified after 25 years. Oh, so we're think, getting there. So not like a ton of risk. There was some like pre-Iraq war documents sitting around the house, right? I mean, I'm not- Can I ask you something? I would imagine that Biden would have had access to classified documents while he was in the Senate because he was chair of the Foreign Relations Committee yeah. for a while. Do other senators, like what, what? You all, everyone has a clearance. I think that if you're on the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you probably get access to more stuff. Although they all look at it in a skiff in some office down there. The in- Intelligence Committee people have access to much more- uh, highly sensitive stuff, the compartmented covert action programs, CIA budget, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't really know what was found. Um, on the previous tranches, I think I read that one document was top secret. The rest were secret level. So I'm not ready to say there's no there there quite yet. It seems like there was some there, <laughs> some over there, a little more there. Were over multiple there. There's <laughs> yeah, there a little bit there. multiple there's, yeah. But um, secret level papers from 2006 are not as risky as what we know was in Donald Trump's house, which were hundreds of documents, special access programs, human intelligence, like really sensitive stuff at this club full of grifters. Foreign intelligence agents have been arrested at Mar-a-Lago. We got the Philly mob boss guy. So I look, I'm not trying to both sides this, but it is it is um very distinct set of facts. And I'm more concerned about the papers at Donald Trump's club, his golf club, Although I do agree with all the sort of critics in Washington who are saying um, the the way that these um, reports have dripped out about more and more documents in Biden's residence has muddied up everything. Yeah. And apparently one of the reasons why um, this is sort of just dribbled out over the course of several weeks now, uh, Charlie Savage had a piece in The New York Times about this. Biden's lawyers initially told the Department of Justice in November They had no reason to believe that official records um, from Biden's time as vice president, or for that matter, when he was in the Senate, ended up anywhere else but the Penn Biden Center. Right. So therefore, they wouldn't have checked everywhere else because the lawyers were like, oh, no, no, that all the records were shipped right to uh, the Penn Biden Center. And so that's it. Now, it turns out then. Right. But and there was also some reporting in The Washington Post that maybe the Department of Justice said, hey, stop your searching. Like, we're going to take this from here. And the Biden lawyers tried to comply and do everything by the book. And that, in the end, I think probably screwed them a little bit. And, you know, I mean, to Mike Turner's question, why else would you take classified documents out of a classified space other than to show someone? Like, yeah, so Biden's plan was to take classified documents, uh, show a bunch of people that he wasn't supposed to show, and then uh, his law- and then have his lawyers voluntarily let people know that he had yeah. classified documents. That was the whole scheme. It doesn't make a lot <laughs> of sense. That was the treasonous scheme. I suspect it was just mistakes, poor record keeping, poor organization more than anything else. It was probably staff level work, if we're being honest. I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody. None of it's good. None of no. it's how you want to uh, to run a railroad. But again, the reason that the FBI agents descended upon Mar-a-Lago without an invitation, unlike the invitation they got from Joe Biden to come to his house in, in Wilmington, was because the National Archives and the Department of Justice said, hey, Donald Trump, looks like you have some classified documents. And he said, fuck you, they're mine. Right. <laughs> that's, that's... Well, first he said, no, I don't. Then he said, they're mine. Then he said, you can't get them. Then he said, I'm moving them. <laughs> and then he said, I mentally declassified all of them, <laughs> which again is another avenue Joe Biden could go down since he's currently president. If he wanted to be a complete idiot like Donald Trump, he could be like, I magically declassify all of this. But he would never do that because that's a uh, making a joke of the system. Yeah. And I realize the media keeps harping on the fact that like, well, most Americans won't know the difference. Well, OK, well, let's tell them the difference because it seems like there's a big one. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I hate when they yada, yada, yada over the difference. Although I, I think the media has done a pretty good job of that. The one other thing that I think is really unfair in a lot of this reporting is people who are pointing fingers at the White House press office and the press secretary and saying, look at the way their a- answers have shifted. Look at the way they didn't answer questions at the White House briefing. You know, Ben and my advice on Pod Save the World when we talked about this was stop cutting out the communications people. Stop keeping things close hold. Try to get everything you can together and get it out as fast as you can. And just like read everybody on your team in who needs to be read into this stuff. I mean, it's so hard when you're dealing with an ongoing investigation or discussion of classified information because you're so constrained about what you can and can't say. Yeah. But I mean, that's the clear mistake here is, you know, things dribbling out piecemeal. I mean, hearing Barbara Romo say 
maybe this is treason hearing them say like obviously he did this to show them to people who donated to the Penn Biden Center who visited all do you think there's a little danger of Republicans overreaching here or is just this what they do to try to gin up a scandal and and go down a whole bunch of investigative rabbit holes. I mean, it seems like there's a pretty obvious rejoinder to a Republican member of Congress who says the only reason you would take classified documents to your house is to show someone. It's like, well, then that must apply to Donald Trump, <laughs> that's too. True. That's sir. true. That's that's not a, uh, a tough pushback from a Sunday show host. But I mean, look, I, that's why I think even when it came to Trump, I've been pretty reticent to buy into those conspiracy theories that he was taking them to like sell them to somebody or. Yeah, I, I just think he's an asshole who wanted to keep a bunch of stuff that was his and is uh, completely reckless. Well, and at least with him, nothing would surprise me with Donald Trump, which I think his his history shows us. Yes. Right? Like, yes. So any of those theories could be true. With Joe Biden, it's pro it's a more limited set of, uh, of circumstances. Yeah, we know him a lot better. Right. Uh, I do <clears throat> think the who did he show them to is clearly an attempt to make their Hunter Biden obsession more legitimate uh, yeah i like the free beacon or one of the one of those conservative publications found some old picture of hunter biden in joe biden's corvette which is allegedly parked in the garage where the classified documents were in wilmington and suggested that that was some sort of aha gotcha which is one of the most embarrassing pieces of investigative journalism i've ever heard i mean they have this oversight committee now they have this special committee on the weaponization of the federal government whatever right and they can't figure out a topic, right? There's like, we're going to look at the origins of COVID. We're going to look at uh, Hunter Biden's laptop. We're going to look at right, right. Chinese connections and right. business dealings. And now I feel like at least they have they have something, which is these classified documents that they're yeah. now going to hang all of their other conspiracy theories on. Um, I don't think it'll be they'll be very adept at this, but, you know, it'll be grist for the right wing media for the next however many months. Yeah, it could become the, the Christmas tree upon which they hang all their little mega ornaments. I, I think I the minute that the Republicans won the House, we knew that oversight was going to become a big problem in, in sort of digging for whatever they can find, whatever dirt they can find for any investigation. This definitely, as you said, I think provides the Republicans a path that at least seems interesting and newsworthy to the press and feels new yeah. as opposed to just like, I don't know, yelling the same things about the border. Although I think at the end of the day, for most voters, like an issue like immigration and the failure to fix our, you know, the border or immigration policy is probably like a more salient topic than any of the stuff we're talking about. And that goes for Donald Trump, too. I agree with that as well. Um, so in other Biden news, we learned over the weekend that White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain will be leaving sometime after the State of the Union and that he'll be replaced by our old colleague, Jeff Zients, who ran the Office of Management and Budget in the National Economic Council in the Obama White House uh, in the second second term and uh, and most recently ran the Biden administration's covid response. Uh, what do you think about Ron leaving and, uh, and Biden naming Jeff as his replacement? I mean, I think Ron Klain. I think about this a lot. You and I worked for two or three White House chief of staff. I think Ron broadened and changed the job more than anyone else I can think of in that role. And that's because I think historically I've thought of a chief of staff as someone that's kind of mysterious, mm. that breathes rarefied air, that you're <laughs> behind the scenes. You know what I mean? You're like negotiating thing with, with senators. Ron did that, but then also found time to like get in the weeds. I mean, he was pushing White House messages on Twitter. He was hosting progressives, doing cable hits, like painting Manchin's houseboat when when necessary, whatever it took to pass that agenda. And like you, you could DM Ron on Twitter and, and get a response. And I literally don't know how he had the time. I remember thinking like, this guy is burning the candle at both ends. This feels unsustainable, but he managed to do it. The, it, it just, shockingly responsive. Shockingly responsible. And I think he deserves a ton of credit for managing that team, managing the government, and getting a ton of stuff passed legislatively. It really is remarkable. And also, like, you and I are both, this jumped out of both of us in, in our prep we were doing for today. Ron started working for Joe Biden when he was 28. 28! He knows that guy inside and out. You know, that's an amazing tool to have at your disposal as chief of staff. I will say, as, I mean, I've always liked Ron. I got to work with him closely um, during debate prep uh, for when Obama prepped for his the reelect debates um and i was like super impressed with how he ran that and ran debate prep and have been impressed with him ever since but like i, I think as chief of staff like he really combined he's got excellent political instincts excellent communication skills 
and also like really fantastic people skills. Yeah, he's just and a like guy. combining those three things, it it's, it's like a really hard thing to do. And I, I don't, I don't know that there's been a more influential, successful, beloved chief of staff than Ron Klain, uh, as long as I can remember. Combining all those things, I, I was thinking that too. And listen, that's not to say I didn't like love and really like working for all the people we work for. But you know, I think of someone like Jim Baker, sort of larger than life, mm -hmm. you know, sort of huge impact. I think Jeff comes in with a different role shaped both by who he is and by circumstances. They know now that there's nothing, nothing's coming out of the Republican House of Representatives. And there's no legislative agenda now. So I think your focus is make sure you're one, effectively managing oversight requests from Congress. That then frees him up to just kind of to run the government. And part of running the government that I think people don't get is, you know, you have laws that were already passed. You have to make sure they're implemented properly. Right. So when you pass the IRA, the big climate change bill that they eventually got passed, um, that's not the end of it. The executive branch needs to make countless decisions and create all these regulatory frameworks to make it workable. Right. You need to determine what kinds of cars are eligible for the tax credit that you can get in the next couple months if you buy an EV. So I think he'll focus on that. He's a management expert. Uh, you mentioned his time at OMB. He's a crisis fixer. Right. He came in and fix the botch rule out of healthcare.gov. There's the criticism from progressives are saying uh, Jeff is too close to the business community. He made money in healthcare and the private sector. You know, they're concerned about that focus. I think those are very fair things to raise and to point out. But I also know that when we worked with him, he fought for increases in the minimum wage, overtime pay. And I also think that Jeff will think that his job is to implement the Biden agenda. You know, he's not coming in there with some um, determination to advance some, you know, corporate interest that is more important to him. No, he's there to serve Joe Biden. Yeah. If if Jeff Zients ends up um, helping Biden make a bunch of anti-corporate decisions or pass anti-corporate policy, then the criticism is well warranted. I just I, I generally have a problem with. Uh, criticism that is only about someone's past and resume and not about the actual decisions and policies they have implemented during their time in government. I think that's, th those should be a subject of criticism. Uh, yeah. And that's, and, and like in terms of, of Jeff, not only did he oversee the NEC during some of Obama's most progressive economic policies, the push for some of the most progressive economic policies, um, he helped run the Biden. He ran the Biden transition, right, and helped hire some of the more progressive people in the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. um, Pramila Jayapal, who's the runs the Congressional um, uh, Progressive Caucus, uh, has you know she she talked to Semaphore about this. She said we really appreciated. Jeff's collaboration with, on COVID policies, on the American Rescue Plan, which both included bold and progressive policies. Yeah. So you see the actual progressives in Congress are are feeling pretty good about them. You know, you get some lefty activists and media types who are upset, but that's, you know, to no, be fair. expected. Hey, listen, I, I think it's good, you know, like voice these things now and then hold them accountable. I also, you know, the job will also change in that there will be people in the White House who are really focused full time on politics and on the reelect in the same way. When Rahm Emanuel left as Barack Obama's first chief of staff, Jack Lew comes in. Jack's really focused on managing the government, but then you have David Pluff coming in to run the reelect, essentially, from the West Wing. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the man who, as of right now, is still Biden's most likely challenger in 2024, our old friend Donald Trump. Uh, NBC reports that he's officially petitioned Facebook to unblock his account and that he'll be returning to Twitter soon. His advisors have apparently been workshopping ideas for his first tweet. I love it. So that's exciting. Uh, Trump is also set to hold his first post-announcement campaign event in South Carolina this Saturday, uh, though he's having trouble getting endorsements from the state's Republican officials who are looking at potential rivals like Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, among others. He's also having some trouble with evangelical leaders who were annoyed that Trump recently blamed Republicans' midterm performance on their abortion stance and then called them disloyal for not supporting him yet. <laughs> Speaking of loyalty, uh, here's a clip of Trump eulogizing Diamond of Diamond and Silk uh, this weekend right after Silk says that um, Trump treated them like family. Let's take a listen. President Trump, I just want to say thank you so much for believing in Diamond and Silk. He treated us just like Laura. He treated us just like the other children, Eric, uh, Don Jr., Tiffany, 
He treated us just like when we came around, when Diamond and Silk came around, it was like we was part of the family. You know, the world has lost one of its brightest stars, real star, but I see that uh, we have another star who is equal to, but she stepped up and she is different. I'm, I'm serious. I thought I knew them both. I didn't. I knew, I knew Diamond, but I didn't know Silk at all. I just learned about Silk. You're fantastic. In fairness, yes, um, that is, is the weirdest comment. In fairness, that is treating her like he treats Tiffany. <laughs> well played. Well played. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> he also complained about the length of the ceremony several times. You imagine going to a funeral, speaking, complaining about the duration. Yeah, he was like, I, we probably should use that clip too. But he was like, yeah, uh, they told me 15, 20 minutes, but I got to be back in Palm Beach. And he's like, the Bengals Bills game is, is unbelievable. Um, anyway, just had to play that clip because yeah, it was so much fun. That. Um, do you think that the Trump being back on Twitter and maybe Facebook, they should make a decision any day now, I guess, um, will help him in the Republican primary. And do you have any uh, good ideas for a first tweet? Well, should we start with the, for the second question first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote, I got a couple for you. Oh, I nice. wanted to see what you think of it. I was thinking, um, they peg it out here. <laughs> It was an all-time great uh, tweet by <laughs> Reverend you know Solomon what? Missouri. That may be for a small audience, but I'm one of those people. Yeah, one of the best uh, Twitter. Uh, look, actually, I guess the problem was that was uh, a long Twitter thread in defense of marriage and monogamy. Oh, so maybe that's not maybe not. Trump. Yeah. Um, another great one was just Ed Balls, <laughs> when uh, the former uh, member of UK Parliament named Ed Balls thought he was searching for himself. Not involved in human trafficking T-shirt. <laughs> experiment on that. Uh, Ray Allen had some doozies. Um, well, there's a good one. In 2013, a woman named Patricia Lockwood tweeted, at Paris Review, so is Paris good or not? And I thought that was a very <laughs> funny one. I think he should just start attacking Elon Musk. I think he should just go to oh, war with good. Elon uh, on Twitter just to sort of kick up some... Uh, oh, just to really like, sort of split the... Like when you go to jail, you got to shank the toughest guy. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like Alpha Dog on Twitter. Which I could see him doing. Like Alpha Troll. That's what I'm hoping for. That's really good. Um... I don't know. Do you think it'll help him in the primary? I asked, I asked Sarah oh. Longwell this on the last uh, on, on on our last episode. Well, she's smarter than me, so what was her take? <laughs> I mean, I'll another, tell you mine first. Another Kenyan college grad. That's right. That's right. I mean, I think I think getting back on Twitter will greatly improve his ability to shape media narratives, um, but that Facebook is ultimately more important in terms of reaching that base. Just because, look, the guy truths up a storm, and they're very funny and weird, and I never hear about them. Like, there's a bunch... In the, in the research we were doing for today, I just couldn't believe that they were real. <laughs> you know, I, I, I texted you when you're like, is that real? I'm like, it's in our research. I, was, I can't believe that's actually real. He technically has more Twitter followers than Facebook friends by a long shot, 88 million to 34 million uh, on Facebook. But I bet way over half those Twitter follows are bots or dead accounts or just garbage. Yeah. But I do. I think he, he's just not getting the attention he craves no. uh, from Truth Social he's uh his interviews aren't even going as far like i do think the power of twitter in general in in a elon musk world uh is sort of ebbing a little bit mm -hmm. uh in in terms of like the media's assignment editor you know yeah. i think there's there's a we could do a whole other episode on that it's not working as well um but i think that for him he needs attention right now and if he's on twitter and he's tweeting all the time and the republican primary will be like you know it, it'll it, sorry by this spring, w the Republican primary will be in full gear. And then, you know, I think he'll get a little bit more attention. It'll probably help. I don't think it'll help him in the general. Yeah. Uh, if, he, if he gets that far. But I do think in the primary, it'll help him get attention. Yeah, I just think it helps him drive the narrative, make the conversation about him. Uh, and his opponents are still these mealy mouthed idiots like Mike Pompeo, who's polling at 1%. And will tweet things like, character and leadership are the same thing and think that that's some sort of like subtweet that's going to help them and it's just it's not we've talked about DeSantis. Not good at this. we've talked about desantis a lot but like the non-desantis other potential republican challengers in 24 are really a pathetic bunch they're very lame <laughs> like they're i don't know lame. what they're thinking i so i, I watch know. nikki haley clips on hannity from the weekend i just saw them on twitter pop mm -hmm. up and she just sounds like it was very like Jeb Bush, mm. like 2015 kind of, here's my talking points and my prepared lines that my consultants gave me that I'm going to drop right now. Like she's like, you know, like what, you know what they say, may the best woman win mm. uh, kind of thing. And then she's like, we lost seven of the last eight uh, Republicans lost seven of the last eight 
uh, presidential election popular votes, which I thought was interesting. But she just it just I'm like, what do you who, where's the Nikki Haley base of support? I think Trump proved to everyone that he I think in the in the 2016, 2015 primary, Trump proved to the base that he was the one who would own the libs the most by doing it all the time. He would attack everybody as hard as he could from the very beginning. He would punch his opponents in the mouth yeah. on debates when normally in politics you kind of like baby step your way into really going after your opponents. He was like, no, I'm just going to go at them as hard as I can. And no one else really threw a punch back at him until the very end. And it feels like they're all kind of walking into that same strategic mistake again. I think like if someone wants to beat Donald Trump, you've got to fight him and go at him and go hard and be relentless. And no one's doing it. Yeah. I mean, what do you make of his challenges with evangelical leaders and, and South Carolina officials? <laughs> You think it's indicative of a broader problem, or do you think these folks will just come around if the base stays with Trump? I, I just think that these so-called faith leaders worship at the altar of power, and they might say they're sitting it out for now, but once they see some momentum gathering behind somebody, any candidate, that's where they will go. And I'm sure they all think Trump is a bad person, but they only care if he advances their agenda of white Christian nationalism and banning abortion, uh, targeting uh, LGBTQ people, and yelling about gay M&Ms or whatever like culture war thing is on Hannity tonight. Yeah, I'm just not going to be looking too closely at the endorsement primary on the Republican side. I'll be looking at sort of the polls of Republican voters. Um, Trump is in the rare position of being a former president who will probably not have the support of his party's establishment. Mm -hmm. um, but remember, last time he didn't need it. No, he beat them. <laughs> Uh, he just needed, to be, and if I was, you know, if I were Trump, I would probably try to, I would probably embrace being the outsider again and attack the Republican establishment that's maybe coalescing behind Ron DeSantis or whoever else it does, you know, and and be the outsider. Yeah, the the only person he seems to be worried about is Ron DeSantis. If it's Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, they're weak. none of these. People. They're just tepid candidates, and. Again, like I just, they're not running hard. And I just think that all these evangelicals, all the faith community, they all rally behind Trump. I mean, look at what the right wing is doing for uh, Matt Schlapp, the head of the American oh, Conservative yeah, we Union. We have talked about Matt Schlapp. He's a right wing creep they put on CPAC. He runs this organization. This man was accused of grabbing the genitalia of a male campaign staffer on Herschel Walker's campaign staff. This was like a few weeks ago. Yeah. And the Republican establishment is completely rallied around him. They don't care at all. Yeah, he was down at Mar-a-Lago uh, uh, with with Trump for an event after after this whole thing broke. Incredible. Um, but to the uh, speaking of evangelical values, yeah. um, the National Pro Life Summit happened uh, took place, and uh, DeSantis won. They took a straw poll. DeSantis won fifty four percent of the vote to Trump's nineteen percent. Now it's only two thousand votes, so it's not it's it's more than a couple officials, but it's still not big. But it's it's very interesting though that. Um, that DeSantis won by that much. Yeah, it is interesting, although Trump had just recently told that specific group of people to that they off. were yeah. at fault for losing <laughs> yeah. in 2022. You're at fault, and then because you didn't endorse me, that's disloyality. <laughs> right. That's That was his one-two punch yeah. with that. Yeah, so it wasn't great politics. Um, all right, so finally, some 2024 Senate news. Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego of Phoenix announced today, sorry, announced Monday, that he'll be running for Kirsten Sinema's Senate seat. Uh, the newly independent cinema hasn't yet announced whether she'll seek re-election. And uh, Republicans Carrie Lake and Blake Masters are both considering running as well. They're back. Incredible. Um, here's a clip from Gallego's announcement video. The rich and the powerful, they don't need more advocates. It's the people that are still trying to decide between groceries and utilities that needs a fighter for them. There is no lobbyist for working families. We could argue different ways about how to do it, but at the core, if you're more likely to be meeting with the powerful than the powerless, you're doing this job incorrectly. Uh, what'd you think of the announcement and uh, and Gallego's chances in general? Great, I love the score on the video. It really came through in the audio only yeah, version. Yeah, I didn't notice it when I was watching the video. Uh, great video, I, I've been reading his book 
Um, guy goes book because I'm a. Do you read I'm ten books? I'm a DC insider. You're Don. a new parent. I'm, How many? What? what what's been, your reading I schedule? I didn't say I've finished this book. <laughs> I've been reading his book because I'm a incredibly well sourced DC insider who <laughs> knew this are. announcement was coming, uh, like everybody else in the country. <laughs> He's an incredible story. I mean, he grew up dirt poor, single mother with four kids, not only absent but an abusive father. The guy just like willed his way into Harvard somehow. Yeah. Uh, didn't fit in culturally because it was too many Kushners and basically kind of like it <laughs> asked to leave for a semester. Signed up for the Marine Corps, served in Iraq, served in a unit that's uh, unbelievable casualties and just horrific combat and has come out. You know, the book leads with him talking about like going to find a friend who's really struggling with mental health disorders. He's dealing with PTSD. I mean, it's an amazing bio. I think the thing I like a lot about Ruben Gallego is he talks like a human being. Yeah. I was gonna... He's a regular person, for better or for worse, politically. I'm not saying this like, you know, he seems like a very cool guy. It would be fun to get a beer with, which is the old test. Um, and the contrast of that video and who Ruben Gallego is with Kirsten Cinema like strutting around Davos <laughs> with the mooch or whatever, doing whatever they do there, or, you know, Carrie Lake still on her weird I didn't lose campaign, Blake Masters being the single most repugnant human being ever focus grouped. I mean, I, I like his chances. What about you? Um, yeah, I, I like his chances. Look, I think that if it's a three-way race, right, and we don't know about cinema, if, she, if she's going to run yet, uh, but if it's a three-way race, the math is unforgiving for either cinema or Gallego. Not impossible, but yeah. really tough. Uh, there, But there was a, a public policy poll uh, from December that Gallego's... Uh, campaign and waiting at that point put out and um it had lake carry like at 41 percent guy go at 40 percent cinema at 13 percent and they argued i think persuasively in that memo that the spoiler here would be cinema if she runs for because sure she has no path to win and i i think that is true i think if there's a three-way race uh and it's Gallego, I mean, I don't think another Democrat's going to run in the primary, at least a, a serious challenger. But if it's Gallego is the Democratic nominee, Cinema is the independent and the Republican, like, I don't think there's a path for Cinema in, in that situation. I think yeah. it's either the Republican or Gallego. Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I hope you're right. I mean, I think clearly Gallego is going early because he wants to clear the field and raise a ton of money. That primary is in August of 2024. Oh, is it? <laughs> yes. It's so far Woo! from now. That's but, a long time. But but Kirsten Cinema, I mean, she, she, left the Democratic Party and she became an independent because she knew she would get smoked by Gallego in a primary. So I think there's I have some questions like, what does the DSCC do here? Are they forced to help her in some way or at least not get involved to keep her from uh, completely leaving the party, not caucusing with the party so we lose our majority? It's tough because, and uh, I think they asked Durbin this when he was on the Sunday shows talking about Joe Biden's stature. Um, <laughs> He was like, oh, it's too early and blah, blah, blah. But if it's in August of 24, then the D like, I don't know how many other Democrats will run in the Democratic primary, but you could see the DS being like, OK, we're going to hold on because we don't want to get in the middle of a primary. But if, if it's just Gallego and he clears the field on the Democratic side, I don't know if I was the DS, I'd be like, yeah, we're the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee. We are here to support Democrats. Kirsten Cinema. well, it's nice that she caucuses with the Democrats. Nothing against her. She's just not a Democrat. And so we're going to support the, support the Democratic candidate in the race. Now, I think that will also depend on other polls <laughs> yeah, yeah. if they if they come in similar to the PPP poll and how much money Gallego raises. Now, I would I'm going to go on a limb here and say he's going to raise plenty of money. She has a ton of money right now. She, gets, cinema she gets it from all the hedge fund people yeah. that love her. Um, but I think that he will have no problem raising money because oh. I think progressives, not just in Arizona, but all across the country will want to donate to this. Campaign. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, and I'm right there with him. I just want to like sit down with her and just be like, hey, what do you want to do in life? What what like gets what gets you fired up in the morning? I think because hanging, I think we saw what she wants to do in life at, at Davos. I think like hanging around rich people and uh, and opining on like deficits and debt is that's what she likes. <laughs> I really think that's what she wants to do. Yeah. Which makes me think that I think there's an outside chance that she doesn't run. I mean, it doesn't seem very fun. I don't think she's held a town hall in the state in like two years. Um, very... doesn't seem like she likes the job. Right. I wouldn't like the job either if I was getting criticized by everybody all the time, but some people just, I guess, want to be in elected office. 
there's always been something like obviously her and mansion have been pains in our ass uh are being the democratic party for the last couple of years but like there's always something about mansion where i'm like you know what it's it, it's very possible that this is just like it's who joe mansion is it's what he believes he's representing west virginia he's a conservative democrat that's it you know and i don't have to like that i don't but that's i think that is who joe mansion might be mm-hmm. with with kirsten cinema like she was a Green Party person. Right. She she's gone back and forth so many different times. Like I really do think she's more in it for Kirsten Cinema than she is for any kind of like I don't know that her beliefs are really. I'm confused cool. by them. That's for I'm damn very sure. confused. Uh, by them. Certainly confused why you'd be a Democrat if you don't want to help working people with you know lower prescription drugs or I don't know raising taxes on super super rich yeah. hedge fund people. I mean, look, the, if I were to sum up the number of times that uh mansion and cinema turned me into like a red-faced rage-filled monster i think mansion wins in a landslide but to your point i get his politics he's in a trump plus 39 state he's in a trump plus 39 state and i don't know why i'm going on a like a joe mansion appreciation you love the guy yeah but um the guy is now one of the least popular senators <laughs> in the country he's facing re-election 2024 and then helped joe biden he cast the vote for joe but for the biggest climate change legislation yeah. in decades I know, I know. so i'm just saying it's weird okay and then the shiva staff left to become an oil lobbyist, right yeah exactly so it's all weird it all kind of makes sense but back to back to gallego you were just talking about why you know cinema's embrace of of the wealthy i do think every time you read a story about gallego he's like oh he's a progressive challenger to kirsten cinema i think he doesn't want this to be an ideological race and you can tell because that whole video and the part we played was all about she standing up for wealthy interests and mm-hmm. i'm standing up for people mm-hmm. and it's going to be very you know and and our our friend rebecca katz who worked for john fetterman is on this campaign as well it's going to it's going to remind us of the way that fetterman ran against dr oz yeah. which is not in an ideological way but much more in a economically populist way yeah. and i think guy goes very good at that yes and it, with uh with a ton of bio to sort of yes show you know sort of credential those values like 100%. this is who i am this is where i'm from that's why i believe these things and and, i think that's the strongest message you can have and like you said he talks like a normal person when he was on i remember when he we interviewed him on positive america in like 2017 he finished the interview with with me and Dan, and I was like, he could be like a fifth Pod Save America co-host. co-host. <laughs> he said, that's how he talks, and and he's going to come back on the pod this Thursday. He's going to be on. Uh, we're we're going to interview him this Thursday. So Dan's going to grill him. <laughs> um, so, Fingers crossed. We'll see. So uh, Sherrod Brown and Tim Kaine have both said they're running for re-election. Mm-hmm. Debbie Stabenow has, uh, of Michigan has said she's retiring, and then Mansion and John Tester still haven't decided. Knowing all this, plus the Gallego news. How are you feeling about the Senate map in 24? I mean, it's hard, right, John? I mean, it's never great. Again, we have to defend an R plus 39 state uh, and an R Trump plus 16 state, which is Montana. Now, luckily, John Tester is wildly popular. Yeah, that same poll that I said mentioned is very unpopular now. Tester, 60% approval, uh, 30% disapprove. That's wild for being a Montana senator, Democrat. Uh, I think 538 had the stat. Only five senators out of 100 occupy seats that the other party's presidential candidate won in 2020. Three of those are red state Democrats who are up in 2024, Ohio, Montana, and West Virginia. So numerically, it's a very difficult year for us because we're defending, Democrats are defending 23 seats. Republicans are defending nine seats. The only thing the only thing that really counts as a pickup opportunity for Democrats is Ted Cruz again in Texas. Now, Hope Springs Eternal with that asshole. Or... Uh, Rick Scott in Florida, who is, you know, just a singularly repellent mm. uh, human being. So, again, you know, Florida's tough. It was a tough story at the Washington Post over Ooh, the weekend that about was the utter lack of organizing your infrastructure in Florida. That was so tough that I skimmed it. Um, <laughs> Cruz is, yeah, Cruz is also underwater, as he has been for a while. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, of that crew, like, I'm actually most worried about Manchin keeping that seat. Mm-hmm. Or Manchin even, I mean, Manchin might not even run again. He, You know, he, Chuck Todd asked him about that over the weekend. And he um, he's, he ruled out running for governor. He did not rule out running for Senate again or running for president, potentially, which yeah. is interesting. Well, he gives you one, and then he takes one away. You know? right, yeah. <laughs> but you could see if he does run for president or he just doesn't run at all, it's because he look, he's going to look at that. He's at 40 percent approval, 53 percent disapproval in West Virginia. Uh, governor Jim Justice might run, who's very popular, very popular there. So I think that would be a really tough race for him. Um, Sherrod is a fantastic candidate. Um, obviously, like we were all disappointed when Tim Ryan 
uh, didn't win and, you know, in fact, lost by a similar amount mm -hmm. uh, than, than to Biden did in, in, in 2020. Um, but Sherrod Brown is an incumbent and Sherrod Brown has is a survivor and has like won many times in that state before when it has still been a, 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 right. a reddening state. It, look, and, and Tim Bryan, he ran a great race. He deserves a lot of credit. He outperformed what I think a lot of pundits, myself included, thought he could do. Yeah, um, yeah he did a few points better than Biden, yeah, I should say. That said, I think Sherrod Brown has proven to be like um, a singularly talented politician in terms of forging and keeping a connection with working class union voters in Ohio. And I don't know, he seems like he's been able to fend off some of the culture war focused fights that Republicans draw other candidates into. Now, it's a tough state. Uh, Trump carried it by eight, mm -hmm. I believe. So it'll be very hard. But, um, you know, it's sort of like putting one of your best fighters out there. And, it, it out. and for all of these races, it depends on who the Republicans nominate, exactly. as we have seen and as we just saw in 22, in addition to Ohio Republicans perhaps nominating another very extreme candidate. Um, the other two Democratic senators with tough reelects, Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin, Bob Casey in Pennsylvania. Wisconsin and Pennsylvania haven't exactly been putting up uh, mainstream Republicans. <laughs> no, they have not. Uh, in recent in recent, And again, times. two incredibly popular um or, or, sorry, sorry, again, two incredibly good candidates there. Bob yeah. Casey, I know, is dealing with some health issues, but I think Pennsylvania is also trending in a better direction. Uh, and Nevada, Jackie Rosen will be up. Oh, yeah. I forgot, um, I forgot about Jackie she's Rosen She's excellent, though. Well, this because you don't... God, there's just so many races that are tough. It's because you, <laughs> you don't have to worry about her for a second. She's that good. Remember, we, do we ran to her at the... Uh, yeah, on our way out of Nevada. We were leaving Nevada. We went to grab some food. Uh, we ordered every single tater tot or tater tot adjacent menu item and then we ran into u.s center yeah she's fantastic um and then and debbie sabineau there should be some really good democrats in michigan yeah uh that could that could uh run there and again i know uh, michigan republican party also a fucking mess so they, they might nominate someone pretty extreme as well hopefully um okay when we come back uh we will have our interview with democratic house minority leader hakeem jeffries this episode of pod save america is brought to you by carrie Yuma. The sustainable sneakers worn by skaters and surfers. They're reimagining classic sneakers with you and the planet in mind. It's the middle of winter. Time to get real about layers. Lining. Everything that's going to keep you warm and comfortable when you head out the door. When you can leave the parka at home, the best-selling Aka is just right. 20,000 five-star reviews. Over 70,000 waitlisters. Even your favorite celebrities love this versatile, crazy comfortable shoe. This is Carrie Yuma's new school take on a classic sneaker. Take your pick of durable organic cotton canvas or ultra soft responsibly sourced suede. Carrie Yuma says cozy shouldn't come at a cost to the planet. That's why they created Katuri and Aka Therma, winter boots designed high tops made with 100% vegan and recycled materials and produced in a way that's ethical and transparent. One thing you should know about Carrie Yuma is that they're obsessed with comfort. Even their insoles are lined with vegan shearling. Hey, what kind of jacket does a butler wear in Boston? What kind? A valet parka. <laughs> My God. <laughs> For every pair of sneakers sold, Carrie Yuma's team plants two trees in the Brazilian <sighs> rainforest. You know, I when I was a kid, I used to think they were called Parkers. that And that because, the people were just saying Parker because I'm from Boston and everyone was using the accent. Oh, yeah. That it's makes a real, sense. real thing. For a limited time, Pod Save America listeners can get an exclusive 15% off your pair of Carrie Yuma sneakers. Go to C-A-R-I-U-M-A dot com slash crooked to get 15% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Blue Land. If you're anything like most people, setting grand resolutions for the new year never works. It all feels so daunting. So try this instead. Start small and think about all the little habit changes you can make one step at a time. That's why Blue Land is perfect because they make it so easy to start a new low-waste lifestyle. No massive overhaul of your routine, just tiny changes that add up to a huge impact. Here's one. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic by reinventing cleaning essentials to be better for you and the planet. Here's the idea. They get beautiful, refillable cleaning products. Nice. You fill your bottles with water, you drop in the tablets, and you wait for them to dissolve. You'll never have to grab the bulky cleaning supplies on your grocery run. It, it, laundry no detergent. Sense. It's like a big, huge thing. You don't it need that. It makes no sense. Why are we shipping water all over the place? We got water out of the faucets for now. You know, that's a whole nother issue. Uh, for Blue Land, the refill started just $2.25. You can even set up a subscription or buy in bulk for additional savings from cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner, laundry tablets, 
All Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. Try their Clean Essentials Kit, which has everything you need to get started. Three bottles of cleaner plus a bottle of hand soap. Comes in beautiful light scents such as iris agave, fresh lemon, and eucalyptus mint. Blue Land has a special offer just for Pod Save America listeners. Get 15% off your first purchase of any product to get you and your year started right. We love Blue Land. Have all Blue Land products. Refill them up. They're great. You only have one set of bottles. You don't have to keep throwing out plastic bottles, which is terrible for the environment and annoying. Uh, to get 15% off your first order, go to blueland.com slash crooked. That's 15% off your first order right now when you go to blueland.com slash crooked. That's blueland.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by Article. Article. What better way to start the new year than with a refreshed, newly decorated home? Article has everything you need with their stunning range of living and dining room furniture and decor. Love Article. We have lots of Article furniture here at Cricket Media. It looks great. It's affordable, easy to set up, comes really fast. You know, you don't have to wait for a long delivery. We get some chairs, we get some couches, we get it all. Article is the easiest way to make your space look beautiful. They combine the curation of a boutique furniture store with the comfort and simplicity of shopping online. Article's team of designers focuses on beautifully crafted pieces, quality materials, and durable construction. They're dedicated to a modern aesthetic of mid-century Scandinavian industrial and bohemian designs. Article has fast, affordable shipping. is available across the USA and Canada. Free on orders over $999. All in-stock items are delivered in two weeks or less. Article cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. No showrooms, no salespeople, and no retail markups. Save up to 30% over traditional retail prices. Article's offering our listeners $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. To claim, visit article.com slash crooked, and the discount will be automatically applied at checkout. That's article, A-R-T-I-C-L-E dot com slash crooked for $50 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Joining us now is the minority leader of the House of Representatives, New York Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. Leader Jeffries, welcome to Pod Save America. Good morning. Great to be here. Uh, So minority party in the House doesn't usually have that much power. Uh, This majority can barely find common ground with each other, let alone Democrats. Uh, Their plan seems to be, you know, launching investigations and creating crises. Uh, What's on your to-do list for the next two years? And uh, what do you think you can accomplish in an environment like this? Well, you know, we're committed to trying to find common ground whenever and wherever possible with the other side of the aisle to make progress, right, for the American people. That's why we were sent to Washington, not as Democrats and Republicans, as Americans fundamentally, to do a job for the American people. So, you know, we continue to extend the hand of partnership to the other side of the aisle to do reasonable things to advance the ball for the American people. And we can get into the specifics about what that could look like. Uh, But we will combat extremism whenever and wherever it's found. And I think the first issue that's going to be in front of us is to make sure we don't default on our nation's debt for the first time in American history. And we know that there are Republicans who want to essentially hijack the debt ceiling issue in order to extract painful cuts to Social Security and Medicare. We're going to draw a line in the sand. Social Security is not negotiable. Medicare is not negotiable. And we are not going to negotiate with hostage takers. So that has to be done. We hit the debt ceiling yesterday. uh, And so uh, we need to deal with this issue quickly. Uh, and efficiently, and then we can get on to doing other things in pursuit of common ground with the other side of the aisle. Have you or your team had any discussions with uh, some of the more moderate Republicans in the House who are maybe sitting in Biden districts about a discharge petition? We haven't had those specific discussions yet, although, as you point out, a discharge petition is one possible avenue. I think the most important thing that can be done is that Kevin McCarthy should just bring a straight, clean debt ceiling bill to the floor of the House of Representatives, confident that every single member of the House Democratic Caucus would support it. But we would need five, six handful of reasonable Republicans to do what has consistently been done for approximately 100 years in terms of dealing with the debt ceiling issue. It's been done under Republican presidents, whether that was Reagan, Bush the father, Bush the son, Trump two or three times. I believe Democrats helped do it. Uh, And this relates to debts that the country has already incurred, has nothing to do with future spending issues. Let's have that debate. 
uh, but we're not going to allow that debate to unfold with a gun being held to the head of the American people. So, I mean, Kevin McCarthy kind of seems like a guy who who drove off a cliff and he's still like turning the wheel like it's going to help. Does it help that Trump is out there this morning saying Republicans should not cut Medicare, Republicans should not cut Social Security as part of the debt ceiling hostage taking? Do you think that will influence uh, House Republicans? It's possible. I think the most important thing is that the American people have earned Social Security and Medicare, paid into it their entire lives, worked to get to a point where they can retire with grace and dignity. And there's just no circumstance where we should be even having a discussion, particularly as it relates to the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Specifically to your question, I do think uh, that as it relates to some of the extremists on the other side of the aisle, perhaps what Trump has to say on this issue could be meaningful. Although, as we saw you know, during the opening week of the 118th Congress, even Trump's perspective as it relates to McCarthy didn't fully sink in uh, until after 15 votes. And they wouldn't take his call. Well, so didn't we just go through a whole fight where Kevin McCarthy promised he'll, he will never do what he should do? You just said, Kevin, this is what Kevin McCarthy should do. He never does what he should do. And he just promised he won't do it. So what happens then? I mean, he said he won't do it. So then where do we go? Well, Kevin McCarthy says a lot of things and then does something else. (laughs) That's a good point. So, you know, the reality is on this issue, I think perhaps the business community has consistently weighed in and suggested that a default on our debt would be catastrophic, highly problematic, unprecedented, and could collapse the economy, send it into a tailspin, a deep recession, if not worse, not just the U.S. economy, but across the world. My suggestion is he's not necessarily going to do the right thing, perhaps, as it relates to preserving Social Security and Medicare. uh, But there are other reasons why people come to a conclusion. And perhaps in this instance, the business community can prevail upon my friends on the other side of the aisle. Didn't those friends ever come up to you kind of quietly be like, I'm really sorry about these freaks? (laughs) <laughs> like, I just, I can't believe it. I just, this is not what I ever wanted. I can't say it publicly, but man, these are freaks. I haven't used the, heard the <laughs> word freaks being used, uh, but okay. I understand uh, uh, why you might characterize some folks uh, using that type of colorful language. They, they certainly, you know, in my view, are extreme. Yeah. And I think the American people have seen that over and over again. And we've been very clear. On a variety of issues, we believe in a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. They're extreme on abortion care. They want to criminalize abortion, impose a nationwide ban. We believe in Social Security and Medicare. They're extreme on it. They want to blow it up. We believe in democracy. Apparently, many of them don't. Uh, they coddle insurrectionists, perpetrate the big lie. Oh, we're getting towards the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go through the alphabet. Uh, but, you know, the, the reality... Uh, is, I think, in my view, what best captures the moment that we're in is a level of extremism uh, that the vast majority of the American people are not comfortable with. And our job moving forward is to continue to contrast that with who we are as Democrats, people who are committed actually to making a difference in the lives of everyday Americans on issue after issue after issue. So uh, you've said no negotiating over the debt ceiling. Biden has said that, Schumer has said that, a lot of Democrats have said that. Um, Some of the Republicans who uh, have said we can't breach the debt ceiling, uh, like Congressman Fitzpatrick, uh, he's saying he still doesn't want a clean increase, right? Even though he thinks we shouldn't. He also said the other day that he has been in discussions with uh, Josh Gottheimer, representative who's in your caucus, about a possible bipartisan deal. What do you think about what Godheimer is doing there? And like, I do think one way you guys could get pulled into negotiations is with people in the Democratic Party, like Manchin's been saying this in Davos and Godheimer could be like pulling you guys into negotiations. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I haven't had a conversation with Josh about this, but I think he also understands um, generally, as do all of the members of the House Democratic Caucus, that you, you cannot have a legitimate negotiation with hostage takers, people who uh, are trying to leverage a moment that could result in catastrophic consequences for the American people, a default uh, on our nation's debt for the first time in our 247-year history as a country. 
can't have a negotiation about anything in that context uh, if you don't have responsible people on the other side of the aisle. I think at the end of the day, Kevin McCarthy probably understands, as Mitch McConnell understands, that we can't go down this road. But I think what the Republicans are working through is that they've got a very small majority, as we've seen, um, with some very unruly, extreme individuals who are intent on sort of driving their own ideological perspective, even if that means the American people, the economy, or other things that we care about being tossed over a cliff. So Kevin McCarthy, we know he cut a bunch of deals, some public, some private, to get the job. The White House is calling on him to come clean about them, to release like this secret three-page memo that apparently exists. Do you think this memo exists? Like, Do you think we know the full extent of what he promised? We definitely don't know the full extent of what has been promised, but I do think that that will begin to come to light. Many of Kevin McCarthy's own uh, members have expressed an interest in trying to figure out what was promised to some of the more extreme elements. Now, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, the reality is we can either figure out a way on issues like the debt ceiling, on government spending, avoiding a shutdown, the farm bill, reauthorizing the FAA. These are things that we have to do this year. And we've got to, or this term, and we've got to find a way to find a reasonable group of Republicans interested in governing, not burning down the House uh, so that we can advance the ball for the American people. And hopefully, um, you know, Kevin McCarthy will be able to corral his folks to try to find that kind of common ground. But that remains to be seen because of the extreme nature of so many folks on the other side of the aisle. Jamal Bowman, your colleague, has suggested that Maybe Democrats could use some of the uh, things Kevin McCarthy gave away to get the job, like the motion to vacate, which allows any member of Congress to force a vote on basically firing him as speaker. Do you think is that the kind of good trouble that the Democrats want to get into, like putting forward the motion to vacate? Well, you know, the motion to vacate issue, we had a very different process that was in place. Once the House elects a speaker, the House should elect a speaker for that term. That's kind mm -hmm. of my view of it. And but different decisions were made in terms of the motion to vacate. And we'll see how that all plays itself out. I do think that there are areas of the rules package that perhaps um, will provide some of our members an opportunity to advance issues that could be debated on the floor of the House of Representatives uh, in an open way. For instance, I think uh, Speaker McCarthy has suggested that there will be legislative Wednesdays um, from time to time where bills that have been voted favorably out of a committee would automatically be brought to the floor for a vote. Uh, not necessarily just Republican bills, but Democratic bills. That actually is an area uh, where there could be opportunity, uh, even though we find ourselves temporarily in the minority, uh, for our members to advance priorities similar to um, some of the things that Representative Bowman may be talking about. Cool. So speaking of uh, 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 Bowman, there's been a lot of uh, questions about some of the decisions being made by uh, Democrats in New York. Uh, uh, the governor's uh, uh, judge just got rejected by a Senate committee. There's been a lot of anger about what happened with redistricting. In fact, a lot of people think that some dumb decisions by New York Democrats are the reason you're leader instead of speaker right now. Are you frustrated? Are you frustrated by what's been happening with New York Democrats? Well, Democrats in general are a noisy group of people, and certainly that's the case uh, back home in New York. Uh, I do think that we need a serious after action report, which is underway right now. I think both the DTRIP, DCCC is looking at uh, the New York situation, uh, as well as the state Democratic Party. What happened? Why did it happen? What went wrong? What needs to occur to put ourselves in a much stronger position uh, in 2024. Speaker Pelosi, uh, who's been an amazing, giant, uh, heroic, iconic legislative leader, has always said, don't agonize, organize. And at the end of the day, you know, my view is we can't agonize over what happened and what may have occurred had things gone differently in New York and a variety of different factors came into play. Certainly, 
uh, the fact that there were challenges at the top of the ticket in the governor's race, which was much closer than many of us have expected. And the closer, closest governor's race, I think, since 2002, and had some challenges in suburban Long Island and in the Hudson Valley, there were consequences for our candidates. And that may be a starting place to figure out how we can improve upon our performance. And like someone like, say, George Santos was probably beatable. <laughs> probably could have figured out a way to come up with an argument against George fucking Santos. Yeah, yeah. which version? Think? Yeah, that's um, the hard part. Just one last question about this. So uh, it's been this strange fight over this judge. You have uh, uh, Hochul uh, basically going up against unions now. A lot of progressives being angry about having this fight. You got drawn into this fight. Can't imagine you're happy about it. Yeah. Is it time to move on? Is it time to just let, put a new judge up here? Or well, you know, keep this fight going, you think? Yeah, well, I, you know, <laughs> hopefully back at home, they're going to be able to work this out. You know, both the Senate Democratic Conference in partnership with Judge Hochul, part of the chat, I mean, with Governor Hochul, part of the challenge, I think, uh, is that it's a convoluted process by which Governor Hochul can actually choose and nominate someone to be a chief judge. She can't just figure out who's the best person and put that name forward. Uh, there is a committee. Most of the membership of that committee was controlled, as I understand it, by the prior chief judge mm -hmm. and the prior governor. And then they recommend, I think, seven names and then Judge Hochul I don't know why I keep calling it Judge Hochul. <laughs> Governor Hochul uh, has to choose from that group of people. And, uh, and you know, she chose a judge, in my view, was, all right, he should have a full and fair hearing, which has just occurred, and then an up or down vote on uh, the floor of the New York State Senate. And it's going to be what it's going to be. And at that point, he either is voted favorably uh, by the body, or he's rejected by the body, and then we can move on. Okay. Um, your A to Z speech, where you handed uh, the speakership to Kevin McCarthy, has gotten quite a bit of attention. Two questions on it. Uh, how long did you take to come up with the word zenial, and can you use it in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, zenial was the toughest word. I was good. Yeah. The whole time come I was on. waiting for I'm like, what's he going to do with X? That was the only option that seemed available to me. Xerox. <laughs> Xerox. That's yeah, all I got. Xerox. Xylophones in schools. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I think we as a country should adopt a zenial approach. There we go. There we go. To welcoming people in pursuit of the great American dream. Nailed wow. it. It's all Nailed up here. It. Just I don't have here. quality of life issues with that good either. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. You can run it by love it next time for edits. Yeah. Um, Best piece of advice Nancy Pelosi gave you about this job? Take it day by day, you know, decision by decision. Have a plan. Always be prepared to make a decision, uh, but have a plan and then go out and execute it. Is he, Schumer texting you? Is Schumer calling you a lot? He doesn't text. He doesn't, he doesn't really text. Phone. He doesn't yeah, text. Exactly. Are, is he calling you all the time already? Uh, we, we speak a lot. Uh, is but it frustrating? Is it? Is no, it's it... not frustrating. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Leader Schumer has always been a very active senator, even back at home in his capacity as, you know, initially the junior senator and most recently the senior senator. So I'm used to regular communication. This is now a different level uh, because of the implications of yeah. what we both are navigating. Pelosi uh, wanted to try to get him to text. She, was, she <clears> said in a meet interview with him, like, if you texted, we wouldn't have to talk so much. He still <laughs> rocks with a, with a flip phone. Yeah, right? uh, and so amazing. I respect that. Right. Uh, you got to respect it. You're you're. Very powerful guy. You know a lot of powerful people. Can you talk to someone about these email and text fundraising ads from the Democratic Party? It's always the end of a quarter. They're always trying to scare me. There's got to be a better way, right? Well, um, I mean, I do think that there's an urgency that we've all been dealing with. And so, you know, we can, we can have a discussion about, you know, the appropriate level of communication in terms of trying to raise the dollars necessary in the moment that we're in. And mm -hmm. I understand uh, why you would raise that. But the reality of our journey in this country is this is a next level situation that we're confronting. I mean, just the last few years, the Trump presidency, Trumpism, longest government shutdown in American history, two impeachments, an insurrection, a once in a century pandemic, a shutdown of the economy, and then, of course, Democrats being able to come together 
to actually deliver for the American people in a big way. American Rescue Plan, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Chips and Science Act. He's not Act. stopping these texts. No, he's really nice to these <laughs> fundraising people, these fundraising gun, consultants. Right, gun, gun, gun safety legislation, first time <laughs> in 30 years. Inflation Reduction Act. My only point is a lot's going on. Okay. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to communicate on. Uh, and there's an urgency to the moment. Me, I would donate more just to get fewer. To get less. Yeah, yeah. There should be. There should be. Yeah, you should be, should be a Schumer to, option. Where it's you like don't ad get free Hulu. It's yeah. like there should be yeah. Democrat Plus, and then they never <laughs> fucking talk to you. I'll give you whatever you want. Just leave me alone. Um, quick question, no wrong answer. Do you have any classified documents in your house? <laughs> no. Okay. okay. Cool. Say that good stuff. Oh, good. Well, on, uh, on that. Uh, uh, so speaking of fundraising, um, George Santos, your colleague in New York. We recently learned that he stole money from a veteran raising it to pay for uh, care for a dying dog. Is there anything we can do about this guy, George Santos, who made up an entire life, career, everything to get into Congress? Yeah, I mean, George Santos is clearly not fit to serve in the United States Congress. He's a complete and total fraud. Now, we're constrained to some degree by the constitutional uh, requirements. One, basically, someone has to be seated if they meet the age requirement, the residency requirement, and a citizenship requirement. Mm -hmm. Remains to be seen whether he's actually a citizen or not. I mean, I think wow. his whole life actually is under exploration and examination right now because he's basically lied about everything. But there are multiple investigations. Federal government appears to be investigating U.S. Attorney from the Eastern District of New York, Nassau County District Attorney, Queens County District Attorney, Ethics Committee. Brazil wants in. Brazil wants in. <laughs> he uh, may be on Drag Race next season. And so, and so, a lot of people want him. And so we'll, you know, I mean, I, I think we'll be through this Santos situation sooner rather than later. But we've got to let these investigations play themselves out. They'll follow the facts, apply the law, and let the chips fall where they may. Fair enough. Uh, Leader Jeffries, thank you so much for uh, joining Pod Save America. Come back again. Thank you. It was great. Pod Save America is brought to you by Outer Known. Have a New Year's resolution to shop sustainably for 2023? I know you do love it. Always. Outer Known offers comfortable men's and women's clothing. They're the first brand founded on a total commitment to sustainability. It's quite a claim. <laughs> Products are made from organic or recycled materials that feel amazing and never go out of style. Outer Known only works with factories that pay fair living wages and provide safe working conditions. Sustainability is at the heart of everything Outer Known does. It's the driving force behind the brand. Every Outer Known product is comfortable breathable, fits great, designed to make you look and feel great, sustainably made for a better planet. We love Outer Known. Tommy wears those sweaters like every day. Can't stop. Can't stop, stop wearing them. Wears them in 90 degree weather. It's really weird. Yeah. Uh, the blanket shirt's super comfortable. So they comfortable. got great jeans. Go to OuterKnown.com slash PSA25 today and you'll get 25% off your first order. That's OuterKnown.com slash PSA25 spelled O-U-T-E-R-K-N-O-W-N.com slash PSA25 to receive the 25% off discount code. Check them out today, outerknown.com slash PSA25. And don't forget to use the promo code on the page for 25% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Zbiotics. We all have busy lives these days and can't afford to waste a day stuck on the couch because of a few drinks the night before. Zbiotics is the answer we've all been waiting for. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. And it's that byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. Just remember, you got to drink it before you drink alcohol. Always drink responsibly and get a good night's sleep to feel your best tomorrow. It can't help you with the sleep because I, I used Zbiotics Friday night. I didn't get enough sleep because I was out too late, but I woke up feeling tired, but not didn't have a rough morning for the usual reasons you do after you drink too much. Right. Of course. So it worked like, like a, a charm, charm. but like I could have slept a couple more hours. It's funny people say work like a charm. Charms don't work. I don't know what that, yeah, I don't even know what that means. Give Zbiotics a try for yourself. Go to zbiotics.com slash cricket to get 15% off your first order when you use cricket at checkout. Zbiotics is backed with 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash cricket and use the code cricket at checkout for 15% off. Thank you, Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? What type of role are you hiring for? Maybe you need to hire someone to wear many hats, which can be challenging. 
Or you might have a simple position to fill, but it's taking forever to find someone who's a great fit for your company. Whether you need to hire a civil engineer in New York, a pediatric nurse in Nebraska, an attorney in Colorado, or even a mascot in Missouri, ZipRecruiter can help you find qualified candidates fast. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. From accountant to zoologist and everything in between, ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right experience for your job and presents them to you. Bring me to the tigers, uh, (laughs) says a zoologist who uh, was supposed to be an accountant. (laughs) Then you can invite your top choices to apply. It's so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. (laughs) Help, says the accountant in the lion enclosure. (laughs) Try it now for free. At this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Cricket. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. ZipRecruiter.com slash Cricket. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. All right. Before we go, Chief Take Officer Elijah Cohn is here. Uh, and he's got another Take-inspired game that we're calling Take, Take, Don't Tell Me. Great show. Yes. Uh, when I was describing this game to my wife today... She said, I guess I should say hi first. I'm all over the place today. (laughs) Hi, guys. Leave it in. When I was describing this game to my wife today, she said, how is this different than take appreciators? And I said, "It's there are five uh, (laughs) instead of three. (laughs) But you know what? There's a But there's a ranking system. Go ahead. Material difference. Explain the whole, explain the game. There's a ranking system. There's a twist. Okay, so there's a ranking system. I'm going to read you guys five news stories, five takes. You have to rank them from best to worst, with the worst being number one. You can use our political scale as an aid here. Here's the catch. You guys don't know the takes that are coming, so you need to be careful not to fill that number one slot too early. Okay. And listen, I'm going to be responsive here. I have like an order that I'm going to read them, but if you're like clearly going like five, four, three, two, one, like I'm going to mix it up and throw in the spicier ones. So, okay. so think about that. I think I'm ready. I have to think. So, so the... The, the worst take is one. The best worst take is five. Yes. Least offensive. Least offensive take is five. Okay. Got okay. it. Yes. That's a tough one. Okay. So and we I gotta... can't repeat. There can't be three twos. No, that's the, that's the whole, no, that's the the whole trick of it. Yeah. Okay. And then at the end, we'll, we'll grade how we did, see if we want to reevaluate. <laughs> okay. This ranking. We're going to grade our ranking. Yeah. Okay. Let's start here with NBC News. Not <laughs> normally an offender in our take mm. pieces here. Uh, This is a piece from Jeffrey Bellin, who wrote a book about mass incarceration. The headline is, The Road to End Mass Incarceration Could Begin with Mercy for Some January 6th Rioters. Mm. This piece argues that Biden should pardon thousands of prisoners, including some of the January 6th rioters, because it could jumpstart an era of mass decarceration. Among these arguments includes, quote, Biden would push his primary critic, Donald Trump, into a corner. Trump vowed to pardon all the January 6th defendants by commuting sentences for at least some of those who didn't interfere with police. Biden would force Trump, who claims to back the blue, to either endorse his action or narrow his talking points to pushing for pardons for prisoners who assaulted police. Oh, oh that's just yeah, a convoluted t- one. I- I'm going to give that a four because uh, I think uh, I'd love to see President Biden do more pardons and commutations. I think that our prison system, our justice system is uh, terrible and needlessly throws way too many people in prison for way too long. And uh, pardons are good. Are we, but so we have to uh, both agree on one, right? Is that the deal? Yes, or you guys need to come to consensus. You guys oh, need shit. to come to consensus. <laughs> and I would say- Don't you uh, agree? <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> you made a persuasive case. I oh, think set. I'm there with you for four. No, because I think- um, I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I think the the uh, the political uh, idea behind it too, the political strategy behind it that you're probably going to like outflank Trump is ludicrous. <laughs> is very silly. Assuming there's logic. Yeah. Um. I don't know that uh, pardoning a bunch of uh you know violent rioters is somehow going to kickstart the era of mass decarceration no. either. I don't see how that's go- one leads to another. Um, I think these things should be evaluated on the individual merits. So each individual you know, uh, 
guilt if each individual rioter like makes a case that they should get a pardon that's one thing but i, I it's... and some is doing a lot of work here i assume it's some smaller proportion of a, a rather large number i think there's probably some people that are just straight up stone cold morons who wandered in there and are getting like 30 days in jail or something and maybe you let those folks go right i think it yeah i i use the term violent so i think the ones who were <laughs> there, there there was there's some obviously who were uh uh Lost. committed greater offenses than others <laughs> in the rioters so okay tommy vitor thinks january 6 rioters should be free god, god damn it right this is <laughs> planned the whole time all right so this is four so we have a all right so we have we have one one two three we five. have room for one more that can be not as that can be even less offensive than that and then they all have to be worse okay all right. Well, let's see about this one. This one's a little bit of a curveball, this next one. It's uh, attacking Donald Trump from the right. Uh, we were talking about Trump earlier and how you do in a Republican primary. This is a piece from Town Hall, extremely right-wing website, uh, called Trump's COVID Vaccine Blind Spot. Uh, here's a quote from the piece. Pride is a hell of a thing. It's making Trump run for a third time. Trump's pride has unfortunately extended to another point, Operation Warp Speed. Uh, a Trump-initiated endeavor that began early on in the pandemic and ended up with Big Pharma delivering several under-tested COVID vaccines to market. These vaccines, as we all know now, Oof. turned out to not only fail to do their primary thing, which is stop the spread of the disease, but they also arguably hurt and even killed far more people than they saved. Uh, it's I mean, one or two to it's me. got, yeah, this is... The question is if we leave room for worse. I know. I feel like Elijah's gonna. He's 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 got some. He's up his got sleeve. some up his sleeve. His, his uh his uh. I think we should do it. Yeah. I I think it. it's it's pretty bad though. First of all, killed more people I, than they saved is madness. It's just it's just fucking nuts. That's not true. Please look at China where they don't have all the vaccines. I'm also purposed. very sick of the like they were supposed to stop the transmission. Like yeah, when it was the original Wuhan variant. They did stop the transmission when it fucking mutated to Omicron. They couldn't do it. That's not the fault of the people. That's the fault of the fucking virus. Man. What do you guys make of uh, what Trump has to deal with here in his reelection? Oh, oh, yeah. No, I think that I think that cynical folks like Ron DeSantis are going to purposely try to run to Trump's right on this issue uh, yeah. because they think that's the that's well he already the is right? right i mean he won't say if he got boosted i think or he wouldn't put out footage of his vaccination i'm still sticking with two because i think you got one more nastier take up your uh your your brownie man yeah sleeve I, there but i i like any take that vaccines uh killed people or were under tested or bad is just a ridiculous it's foolish it's got it's got to be jared kushner did nothing wrong okay yeah. Oh, off to a hot start here. Uh, let's <laughs> let's uh, mark the halfway point with a clip. We have a clip teed up. Wow. Uh, I'll, I will go ahead and set this up here. Tucker Carlson has been on a heater in mm. defense of heaters recently. Uh, this is a clip from the Fox News host last week defending big tobacco and big nicotine. Have a listen. Why do they hate tobacco? And it's not because it causes cancer. They don't care about your health. They closed the gyms during COVID. Anyone who closed a gym during a pandemic that killed people who were fat clearly doesn't care about your health at all. They hate nicotine. They love THC. They're promoting weed to your children, but they're not letting you use tobacco or even non-tobacco nicotine delivery devices, which don't cause cancer. Why do they hate nicotine? Because nicotine frees your mind and THC makes you compliant and passive. That's why they hate it. It's a real threat to them. This guy's just out of his mind. It's just, uh, it's a very Tucker way of doing it, you know, because he's like, the nicotine does it. You know, it's the, the, the smoke causes lung cancer, but not the nicotine. Um, and it's just, it's elitism. I'm actually comfortable with it being a three with the, with the, uh, yeah, I look, I could make it a three or I could make it a one. I think convincing another generation of people to smoke cigarettes and die from cancer <laughs> in service of your culture war moment is one of the most disgusting, cynical things you could ever do. Um, and uh, I hope Tucker Carlson never gets cancer and dies but uh having watched someone do it it makes me very very mad yeah on a I, deep level i mean i i have to listen to it again to be sure but i think it was a very typical 
slimy Tucker way of talking about it. Mm -hmm. And that he, you notice he didn't just come out and say that like smoking doesn't cause cancer or smoking is safe. Like he sort of, it frees your mind. <coughs> it frees your mind. Well, the nicotine frees your mind. What about the the smokeless products? And then he started. He started saying, Let's "Give him a three. They don't care about your health because they closed gyms during COVID." So that, he didn't. He doesn't directly say it, which is why I'm kind of. He's such a schmuck. Have you ever seen the picture of Sean Hannity uh, jeweling between commercial breaks? <laughs> no, it's very funny. That's cool. Um, all right, yeah. let's 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 three it. Although now we're really gonna need a bad I know, take. I know. Oh shit. Oh yeah, you guys are. You got a one and and five left here. That's a tough uh, place right. to be. All right, buddy, bring it. All right, hold on. I'm just gonna recap the list real quick because I'm writing it down. Uh, and number two, we have Trump vaccines kill people. Number three, nicotine freeze your mind. Number four, January six rioters should be freed. You know what? I'm okay with that so yeah, far. So far, so good. Yeah. All right, here we go. Number four, a piece from Yahoo News. <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? I don't know, but I liked it. <laughs> I'll tell you why I said it like that after I read it. Okay. Um, the piece's uh, headline is, Senator Kirsten Cinema dressed as a sheep at Davos and made everyone else look like fools. <laughs> uh, this piece describes Davos as, or, as you guys just said earlier, this, this piece describes Davos, which is an economic forum of the super rich, as a colorless throng of left-wing conformity i said yahoo news like that because i didn't expect this much of a right-wing take to be on yahoo news uh it notes that kirsten cinema contrasted the rest of davos by wearing white when they were wearing black suits here's a quote cinema represents the old left that once celebrated originality and non-conformity for it or for it she was censured by her own party and then driven out because she did one of the most radical things you can do in American politics today. She reached across the aisle. <laughs> I, don't, I, I hate this person. I know. I hate it, about this. It's a this is a tough this is a tough call because I, I, you could argue it as a five because well absurd and stupid it's not quite as offensive as some of the other takes that we've ranked or you could argue for one just because it's so fucking ridiculous it, it, was this take defending was it defending or criticizing davos as an institution that's sort of what i couldn't oh, yeah. suss out i think he said it's a le- that was a collection of yeah it was criticizing davos for being like too left like it represents the conformist left it's it's the it's okay. the it's the the right wing populist critique of Davos, sure. right? A bunch of globalist elites. I mean, okay, yeah, sure. D- Davos, a place where you, you know, you can host a, uh, a panel on press freedom with Mohammed bin Zayed or some <laughs> Gulf autocrat. But sure, tell me more. Um, I don't know, man. Five or one, I could go either way on this. Much like uh, sort of the leftist horseshoe theory yeah. thing with yeah. the far right. I don't know what to do with this one. What do we think? Do you think he's? Do you think he's saving the heat for There's the end? Be a heater by the All end. All right, let's do a five. Let's do five. Davos. Let's, let's look. Give us our number one. Okay, well, I'll do a cinema at Davos at five. All right, your last one. I think you're going to be happy that you waited for this one last. Honestly, that you kept that one spot open. Um, this is by far the most requested take I've ever gotten in doing any segment uh, about wow. takes for the show. Wow. Uh, it's it's a tweet from Steve Malloy, it. a Fox News contributor. Uh, he was responding to a piece in the New York Times from Ezra Klein, uh, who was writing about clean energy. Uh, and then he was refuting using clean energy with these two points. I was going to say, so far, this seems um, pretty banal. <laughs> Random contributor uh, hitting back at Ezra Klein over clean energy. <laughs> Let's hear it. Here are his counter arguments. He's got two. Quote, number one. Wind power made the transatlantic slave trade possible. Number two, <laughs> modern clean energy has been a disaster. It's really for that. Oh moment. my God. That, oh, yep, you know what? We did it. One. We, yep. we succeeded. I'm glad we waited. Holy shit. I'm glad we waited. That is. That is. Well, wow. like any uh, good Elijah game, you know, you come for the laughs and you leave <laughs> disturbed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really proud of our list. All right, our final list here. Uh, number one, wind power caused the slave tra- or powered the slave trade. Number two, Trump vaccines kill people. Number three, nicotine frees your mind. Number four, January six rioters should be freed. Number five, cinemas a radical at Davos. I like that. Honestly, 
fantastic. It's worked. There we go. Perfect. How do we think the segment worked? I I loved it. So far, so good. I'm excited to um to bring Love It in next time, and because uh, I think he's gonna have some uh, some thoughts, some opinions, some, some opinions, some strong opinions. I think that's uh, Elijah, chief take officer, you did it again with another great take take game. Uh, oh, it's a great time. Yeah, I can add it add it to the pantheon. Uh, and Hakeem Jeffries, thank you so much for for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye, everyone. If you haven't tried Crooked Coffee yet, now's the time to do it. It's very good. It's, it's very good, good. Every order supports Vote Save America's Every Last Vote Fund to make sure every vote <laughs> to me <laughs> every... vote fund. <clears throat> Sorry. Every order supports Vote Save America's Every Last Vote Fund to make sure every voice can be heard. Uh, head over to crooked.com slash coffee. Give it a try today.